Hi, I'm Diane, and I am a clinical exercise physiologist with True Fitness. Welcome to our next workshop as part of our Leash Fit program. It's going to focus on the role of exercise in cardiovascular health and in the treatment and management of cardiovascular disease. And we are delighted to bring this program to you, funded by Healthy Ireland and Leash Sports Partnership. Okay, so the cardiovascular system, of course, is concerned with the heart, but also all of the blood vessels that go all around the body and supply all of our muscles and tissues with oxygen and nutrients. Okay, so in terms of these blood vessels, so the arteries that basically supply oxygen and nutrients to, to every part of the body, um, they, they are very susceptible to damage. And particularly the lining of the arteries that supply the heart with blood and oxygen and nutrients are also very susceptible to damage. And if this happens, a, a very a, a series of reactions basically happens that causes plaque formation within the lining itself. And when this happens, the artery can become narrowed. And the more it develops, the more narrowed the artery becomes. So uh, you can have a partial blockage. And in this case, you have insufficient blood and oxygen going to a particular area. So the blood is trying to go from A to B. But because of the blockage, you have a, a seriously reduced volume of blood and oxygen and nutrients going from A to B. And if this happened, for example, in one of the coronary arteries, this can cause chest pain. Uh, and the pain is, is, is because there's not enough oxygen getting to the tissue, the far side of the blockage. And if this continues to occur, um, so at, atheros, atherosclerosis basically, if it continues to occur, uh, the artery can become fully blocked. And in that, in that case, you can suffer something like a heart attack. Um, but if, and if this happens in the brain, it, it could be a stroke. And if it happens in the periphery, so for example, in an artery in the calf, so the, the, the back of the lower leg, it's called peripheral artery disease. So it can happen anywhere. Um, and if, you, if, if this is the case, then what happens is you can often end up with high blood pressure because trying to get blood and oxygen and nutrients from A to B um, through a very narrow space requires a, a lot of blood pressure. And um, so, so this type of plaque formation can actually increase your blood pressure, trying to squeeze that blood through a small space. And if this happens for a long time, it's, it's called sheer stress and it can actually cause further damage to the lining of the arteries and it can exacerbate the problem. So blood pressure is something that we like to do everything we can to treat. Uh, untreated and in, in severe cases, it can lead to things like heart failure. But rather than really focusing on the diseases of which there are many these that this is just the tip of the iceberg um i really want to focus on well what are the potential causes and what can we do about it so that we we can keep our heart and our cardiovascular system as healthy as possible and also what is the role of exercise so there are modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors and the non-modifiable ones are known risk factors but they're, they're things that we can't do much about so for example age and in previous lectures, we've gone through the physiology of aging. So aging brings deteriorations in different uh, systems, uh, skeletal system, muscle, and so on. And it does to the cardiovascular system as well. It's a contributing factor. It doesn't mean just because we're aging, we're going to get cardiovascular disease. It's just to acknowledge that it has some contribution. Um, gender as well. So women tend to be more protected against cardiovascular disease up until the, the menopause because of estrogen and, and, and other factors. Um, but after that point, the, the protection is decreased. So um, just to be mindful of that. And family history. So if you have an immediate relative that has had that has or, or has had suffered some type of cardiac event, your risk is higher. It doesn't mean that, again, this is inevitable for you it just means you have a higher risk and you really need to pay attention to the modifiable risk factors and do your best in that case and so the modifiable risk factors that are known to cause this damage to the lining of the arteries and in turn plaque formation one of the biggest drivers is smoking okay now all of these factors that i'm just about to mention have their own mechanisms for causing this and because this is only supposed to be a 10 to 15 mini workshop um, I'm just going to list them, but there are um, evidence-based mechanisms as to why they cause these issues. So smoking is a big driver. Hyperlipidemia is a big driver. Um, so basically where you have high amounts of 
total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol and triglycerides, and low amounts of the good cholesterol, which is your HDL. And a lot of people talk about high cholesterol and, and they're kind of they're talking about one figure, which is total cholesterol. But you should know that you do have a good form of cholesterol and you actually want that to be high because it's cardiovascular protective. So high blood pressure is a driver of this issue as well. Physical inactivity and uh, without going into that too much. Um, so like physical activity, when you train your heart rate, your blood pressure, your breathing, everything basically helps you to move from a resting state to an exercising state. And if you challenge your cardiovascular system appropriately in that way over time with good planned phase training, it teaches your blood vessels how to expand and contract as they should. It strengthens your heart. It improves blood flow to, to areas. It improve, improves oxygen extraction from your blood. It, it does so many different things that help promote a healthy cardiovascular system. And But conversely, if you're not doing that, you don't get those adaptations. And in fact, if we look at the, the arteries of people who are chronically inactive, they're much more rigid um, and stiffened than those who are active. And they don't really know how to respond well to that type of stress. Um, so you can get difficulties in that sense. But physical inactivity is a major risk factor for cardiovascular diseases. Obesity, type 2 diabetes, overconsumption of alcohol and stress. And stress is an interesting one. And I'm not sure if it's, if it's really um, on our participants' radar in terms of how it impacts the cardiovascular system, but it has a major impact. So um, if you're chronically stressed psychologically, that stress raises your blood pressure and your heart rate, your breathing rate, and it, it, it taxes your endocrine system. And it does all of the things that exercise does, but not in the right way. So if you're chronically stressed, it puts a lot of pressure on the cardiovascular system. And over time, it can contribute to this whole problem of atherosclerosis or plaque formation. So of course, prevention is best. And the best way of preventing it is to look at all of the modifiable risk factors and do your best with them. So for example, uh, do you need to stop smoking? Do you need to get more active? Do you need to pay attention to your cholesterol levels? Um, do you need to reduce your weight? Is alcohol consumption a problem? Is chronic stress a problem? So maybe there are things that you can address there. And secondary prevention is very, very effective. So for anyone who has cardiovascular issues or maybe even has had a cardiovascular event like a heart attack, the news here is that lifestyle change is really, really, really effective. There are, there's decades of evidence to show this. And in fact, what we would see, particularly in our phase four classes, is for people who had never trained or maybe they were smoking and maybe they weren't paying attention to their diet and all of these things, Sometimes when they've had a cardiovascular event and they come and they train and they start really looking after themselves and getting fit and watching their nutrition and losing the weight and stopping smoking, they're often healthier than they were before, ever before. Um, so there's really, really good news. And I, I understand that, that people can be very afraid um, after having a cardiovascular event. But the difference that this type of lifestyle intervention makes for the people in our phase four groups and that we and everywhere um is absolutely fantastic and the good news is is that um if you start addressing the modifiable risk factors and of course you have medical management in this case um it's very very effective in terms of preventing uh, further events but also um improving your cardiovascular health so in this case of we'll say the condition we're talking about is plaque formation because you have blood trying to go from a to b through a very small space your the, the amount of blood that your heart can get through that area um per beat is less so the heart will respond by increasing the number of times it beats in a minute and it will also respond by increasing the force of contraction and with that you get higher heart rate and blood pressure at rest during every activity of daily living and during exercise. And the overall consequence is that there is an overall increase in the stress of, on the heart. Whereas with training, there, there are numerous benefits to training in terms of cardiovascular health. But again, I'm just caught for time on this workshop with what we've been asked to do. But um, one of the positive adaptations to training, particularly aerobic exercise, is that the amount of HDL or good cholesterol you have increases. 
and its function is to basically um, keep your cardiovascular system healthy through a number of actions. So the more of that you have, um, and the training also helps reduce the total cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol, and the triglycerides. And that combined can reduce your plaque formation or your atherosclerosis. Another positive adaptation to training is you, there are these little tiny vessels that supply your muscles with blood and oxygen and nutrients, and they're called capillaries. And you, with training, you can improve the recruitment of these capillaries, so of the ones you have, but you can also develop collateral, collaterals, which is basically more of them. And also the functioning of the blood vessels, so in terms of how they expand and contract as, in an appropriate way. And all of these combine to improve blood flow to an affected area. So if you have um, reduced blood flow to a section of the heart, or we we'll say if it's a section of the brain or the leg or wherever it is, these adaptations can improve blood flow and they can reduce things like chest pain and leg pain and so on. So another really, really positive adaptation to a particularly aerobic exercise. And finally, um, just an, another key adaptation would be those who are aerobically trained can increase the amount of oxygen they extract from blood, whether it's during at rest or during an exercise. And aerobic training increase, increases the myoglobin content, which is the little protein that carries the oxygen. So you get much more oxygen delivery to where, to where it needs to go. And you have these little energy, these little cells in your muscles, they're called mitochondria, and they're responsible for producing energy for, for anything that we do every day. And the number of them that you have, the size of them, and the activity of the enzymes within them, all of that increases. And that increases energy production and how it, it increases metabolism, how you use fuels and so on. And all of this contributes to improved oxygen delivery uh, and improved um, production of, of energy. And all of these things reduce chest pain. So you, you can't really, you can get these, some of these adaptations from drugs, of course, um, but you also get them from training and are really, really positive in terms of improving cardiovascular health. So, of course, the more training you do, the fitter you get. So that, that increases your cardiovascular fitness. And we know that's an independent predictor of health. But in the context of cardiovascular disease, it's very important because overall, it actually decreases the stress on your heart all day, every day. And um, so with aerobic training, the amount of blood that you can pump out of your heart per beat increases for many reasons. Um, and because of that, because you can inject more blood per beat, your heart rate can actually reduce uh, because it doesn't need to beat as hard because you're getting great um, ejection of blood per beat. And so your heart rate and your blood pressure decrease at rest during activities of daily living and during exercise. And all of these things reduce total stress on the heart every minute of every day. And of course, aerobic training will reduce body fat, which, which, which can massively help with cardiovascular disease as well. And the ultimate... Uh, output of all of these few adaptations that we've discussed is to decrease the overall stress on the heart, which is an absolutely fantastic adaptation, particularly for someone who has a cardiovascular issue. So the exercise recommendations for cardiovascular health are actually the same as that for the general population, and they're the same as we have discussed in previous workshops. So in terms of, of aerobic exercise, this is something that absolutely essential for anyone who has cardiovascular disease or on the opposite side for anyone who just wants to keep their cardiovascular health as good as possible and the aerobic exercise like walking cycling swimming and so on should be done daily and in previous workshops we we would have gone through all of these four types of training in detail so you can look back through our series of mini uh, lectures if you're interested in that so aerobic exercise needs to be done daily um, and it's moderate intensity uh, exercise as well. So there's no need for high intensity exercise in this case. Resistance training is also really, really important. And that should be done two to three days per week as per the guidelines. But I have underlined three because in, in, the more you do, the more benefits you get from it. Three days a week is, is, is very, very good to get these adaptations that we've just talked about, particularly in terms of increasing the size and number of mitochondria, oxygen extraction and so on. Um, so the balance work is not has really no impact on your cardiovascular health but it's recommended anyway because in terms of falls prevention as we age and that should be done two to three days per week 
and your flexibility works for stretching is the same. And again, we we have workshops done on each of these modes of training that are very, very detailed in terms of exactly what you should do. And if you're interested in those, you really need, you, you can contact us or, or look back on, on our lecture series. Okay, so it's resistance training and predominantly aerobic exercise that you knew, need to do for um, primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Okay, so in terms of special exercise recommendations for cardiovascular disease, normally what I do is I take each condition, so angina, peripheral artery disease, whatever it is, and I'd have quite an extensive workshop on each. So in terms of the, the pathogenesis of the condition and the very specific exercise recommendations, in this case, um, we just want to point out some of the real practical recommendations that are applicable across the board and are very helpful if you have cardiovascular issues or indeed just want to look after your cardiovascular health. And the first is to meet the weekly recommendations for aerobic and resistance training that we've just mentioned. So five to seven days a week for aerobic and two to three days for resistance training. And as always, particularly if you're not currently training, you start easy with low intensity and you build up slowly. And that's exactly what we've done with our Slauncher Care participants over the last 12 weeks, who in fact, we just have done post-testing on today and the difference is absolutely phenomenal. And they're only training twice a week for the last 12 weeks. It's incredible. Um, so start easy, low intensity, nice and easy and build it up slowly. If you have cardiovascular disease, the priority is to keep working on your aerobic fitness until you can build up to 30 to 60 minutes of continuous exercise. So when you're starting out, you could be starting out on doing one a one minute of walking and you'd need to rest then for a minute. Then you go again and you could be doing one minute on, one minute off. Then you could be building it up to two minutes on, one minute off. It could be five minutes on, one minute off and so on. Ultimately, you need to get your, your yourself fit enough that you're getting up to that 60 minutes over time. And at that point, you have a very healthy, beautifully functioning cardiovascular system, um, which is obviously of, of crucial importance. Um, if you have high blood pressure, moderate intensity exercise. OK, so, you know, not it, it's where you could talk to me if I was walking beside you. It's, it, you know you're working, but it's not terribly strenuous. When you have finished your training session, that has a 24 hour lowering effect on blood pressure. Um, which is fantastic news if you have high blood pressure. So you'll get this effect from both aerobic and resistance training, but you'll get a slightly greater effect from aerobic training. So daily exercise is very, very important for anyone who has high blood pressure. So if you have peripheral artery disease, angina, a recent cardiac diagnosis, and are poorly conditioned, uh, then interval training is a really good option for you. And what I mean by that is actually what we do in our Saunter Care class. So we ask people to do an exercise for 45 seconds and then they take a 15 second rest. And then we go again, another exercise for 45 seconds and take a 15 second rest. So you're working for 45 seconds, you're resting for 15. Now that was different at the start. It was working for 30 and resting for, well, 15 again. But over time as the fitness levels builds up you can increase your the time you spend working and decrease the time you spend resting that's called interval training and another type of interval training is particularly if your fitness level is poor at the start if you do an aerobic exercise for example marching on the spot okay so you do that for 45 seconds and then you take a rest if you follow that with a resistance training exercise so, for example, a bicep curl, um, lifting maybe a can of beans. Um, and then once you've done your resistance training exercise, you'll go back to aerobic. That type of mixing up aerobic and resistance training lets you do a, not, a lot more work if you're poorly conditioned at the start. And again, we have circuits um, that we've sent to participants and they're available if anyone is interested in, in them. They're, they're, they're free to access. But that's a, interval training can be a really good idea. Um, for any of those conditions plus if your fitness is, is poor at the moment. There are a lot of cardiac conditions I haven't mentioned in this presentation because it's impossible in the 15 to 20 minute lecture. Like for example heart failure that has and then there are different grades of heart failure they have very specific exercise recommendations and they would need one-to-one -one consideration. So what, what I'm really looking at now is um, the, some of the basic uh, things that we're seeing like high blood pressure and so on and how exercise can help those.
the warm up and cool down is essential. We do a full 15 minute warm up with our participants. So we start slowly and we build up the intensity over 15 minutes. And it's during this time that you allow your heart rate and your blood pressure and everything to adjust from rest to exercise. And if you do that slowly, you'll have a really nice training session to follow uh, with very, very low risk of an adverse event. Um, not the case if you skip your warm up. If you skip your warm up, it's very stressful on your cardiovascular system and the, the likelihood of an adverse event increases. And it's all of that is negated with a simple warm up. Um, so, warm up and cool down as well, absolutely essential for cardiovascular diseases. And please take your medication as normal on days you're exercising. If you plan to exercise, whether it's an outdoor walk or whatever it is, and you, you just remembered you haven't take your, taken your medication that's controlling your blood pressure or for whatever cardiovascular condition you have, you don't exercise. You go home, you take your blood pressure and your medication and you exercise later. Um, because when you train, it, it puts pressure on your cardiovascular system. And if you haven't taken your medication, it may not be a good idea. So please take your medication as normal before you train. OK, so hypotension is something that we need to talk about, and that is a drop in blood pressure, uh, which may which can potentially result in fainting during and after exercise. And some of the medications that you take for different types of cardiovascular conditions can promote this issue if you don't take care of yourself appropriately in the class. So we need to mention it. And one of the simple things that you can do is to keep your feet moving between exercises. So, for example, our Sanjay Care participants do an exercise for 45 seconds. And even though they're resting for 15 seconds before the next exercise, they keep wiggling their toes or just keep their feet moving very gently because that keeps the blood from pooling in the legs and it returns it to the heart where it needs to go. And it's really good practice for training. So don't stand still between exercises. Uh, it can increase your risk of low blood pressure. Uh, so just keep your feet moving. Do not skip your cool down. Your cool down is the place that where it allows your body to adjust from exercise to rest. So it slowly brings down your heart rate and your blood pressure and your increased blood flow and all of these things. And uh, if you skip your cool down, that's a bit of a shock to a cardiovascular system, particularly if you have a cardiovascular condition. So please, please cool down and never skip your cool down. Um, also take your time when transitioning between standing exercises and seated or lying exercises and vice versa. So um, it, it, it requires a significant blood pressure response to be able to do that. So to go from, we'll say, standing to lying and lying to standing. And if you have a certain cardiovascular condition and certain medications that you're taking, it, there, there may be a slightly delayed response with this. So you just need to take your time. And if you do that, everything will be fine. And also don't hold your breath between exercises. Just keep breathing. So if you have angina, always have your GTN spray with you. Please attend your checkups regularly and tell your doctor what you're doing, because if you start losing a lot of weight, if that's an issue for you, and if you start getting really fit, and if you start improving your cholesterol profile and uh, your, your glucose profile and your blood pressure and all these things, it may be a case that um, you, you may need to have a discussion about your medications. Um, so just keep in contact with your GP and let them know what you're doing and let them follow your progress and see if any changes need to be made. Be very mindful of cold weather coming into this winter season. Blood vessels can constrict in the cold, which can be problematic if you already have narrowed blood vessels. So it can reduce blood, blood flow, particularly in the coronary arteries and cause chest pain. So what you just need to do is, um, well, A, you could train indoors using one of our um, uh, home-based videos, but B, You'll just need a very good warm up prior to if, if it's particularly cold inside or outside and just make sure that you do that and it'll, it will it will help you not have any issues in this case. Healthy nutrition, of course, is absolutely crucial for a healthy heart and our nutritionist Ruth will be doing that workshop with our staunch care participants next week. And um, but it's beyond the scope of this of this short workshop here. Stress management is also very, very, very important um, for good cardiovascular health and, um, and, and for people who have cardiovascular disease. Okay, and in summary, please try to do what you can to address the modifiable risk factors and it will significantly reduce your risk of getting a cardiovascular issue or a secondary event if you already have one.